Hello, creeps and clowns. Welcome back to Danesthesia, where we talk all things anesthesia, the science, the stories, and sometimes the strange. It's Halloween season, which means it's the perfect time to explore the dark side of anesthesiology. I'm talking about real life potions, poisons, and witches brews that we actually still use in anesthesia today. Five in particular. We've got deadly nightshade, wolfsbane, poison aerotoxin, pufferfish poison, and the classic opium poppy. These mysterious substances were once the tools of witches, assassins, and ancient healers, yet somehow they became cornerstones of modern anesthesia. Let's see how we went from cauldrons to clinical care, and why the line between poison and cure is probably thinner than you think. Let's start with belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade. The name Atropa Belladonna literally means a beautiful lady in Italian. And in Renaissance Italy, women would use liquid drops made from this plant to dilate their pupils, which was considered attractive. But making your eyes more alluring is just one of its many effects, some of which can easily kill you. Belladonna is packed with potent natural compounds like atropine and scopolamine that disrupt communication signaling pathways in your nervous system. These dry out secretions speed up the heart and at higher doses cause delirium, hallucinations, and death. These hallucinogenic or delirium producing effects are what made this plant associated with mysticism and witchcraft. For example, some witch lore claims that belladonna was a main component in the so-called flying ointments, enabling witches to fly on their broomsticks. In the days before ether or modern anesthesia, mixtures containing belladonna, henbane, or mandrake were used to dull pain and induce a kind of dreamy, delirious state during surgery. These were the so-called witch's brews. However, atropine, the very alkaloid that made belladonna so infamous, still lives on in our operating rooms today. We use it to treat low heart rates and reduce airway secretions so that we can get a clearer view while trying to place a breathing tube during anesthesia induction. So what was once a main ingredient in deadly potions became one of the most used drugs in modern anesthesia. From witchcraft to the operating room, not a bad career arc for a toxic plant. Next up is aconite, also known as monk's hood or wolf's bane. This is another flowering herb with a long and sinister reputation. In ancient times, it was used on the tips of arrows to hunt wolves or assassinate rivals. But in early medicine, aconite found its way into surgical brews as a supposed anesthetic. Its main toxin, aconitine, opens the sodium channels that control electrical signals in your nerves and heart causing them to fire uncontrollably. The result is numbness, tingling, muscle paralysis, irregular heartbeats, and eventually cardiac arrest. In Japan around 1804, surgeon Seishu Hanaoka reportedly used a mixture containing aconite to perform one of the first documented surgical operations under general anesthesia, 40 years before ether. Unfortunately, the dosage range between numbness and death is perilously small. A few extra drops can easily stop a heart cold. So while aconite never made it into safe modern anesthesia, its pharmacology taught us important lessons about nerve conduction and the dangers of sodium channel modulation. Today we use controlled reversible sodium channel blockers like Novocaine and Lidocaine, all descendants, in concept at least, of what aconite first hinted at. The witch's poison that paralyzed her enemies and used to be known as the queen of poisons has evolved to become safe local and general anesthetics that produce predictable effects at predictable doses. Now we move from plants to one of the most infamous marine poisons on earth, tetrodotoxin or TTX. This is the toxin found in pufferfish and the blue ringed octopus. And it's the reason why eating improperly prepared fugu in Japan can still kill a diner in minutes. Tetrodotoxin works similarly to aconite by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels on the outside of nerve membranes, preventing electrical signals from firing. That means no sensation, no movement, and no breathing. The person remains conscious, but completely paralyzed and unable to breathe, which as you can imagine is a horrifying nightmare. While tetrodotoxin is way too potent and unpredictable to be used clinically as an anesthetic, it has become an extremely vital research tool. By studying it, scientists learned exactly how nerve conduction works and how to design safer local anesthetics that can block pain without killing the patient. So TTX is a perfect example of how deadly nature's chemistry can be, and how even the worst poisons can teach us about the biology of anesthesia. 
It's the kind of knowledge only a mad scientist or a clown anesthesiologist would get excited about. Next we have curare. If belladonna and aconite were flirtations with poison, curare's formed a full-blown toxic romance with it. Curare is a plant-derived mixture that indigenous peoples in South America used on their arrow tips for hunting. The active compound, D-tubocurarine, blocks receptors at the neuromuscular junction, preventing skeletal muscles from contracting, basically instant paralysis. Hit an animal with a curare arrow, and it would soon suffocate and die. But eat that same meat and you'd be fine, because curare isn't absorbed through the gut. That little pharmacologic quirk became the foundation of one of the biggest revolutions in modern anesthesia. In 1942, Dr. Harold Griffith and his resident Enid Johnson in Montreal used curare during surgery for the first time. It provided controlled muscle relaxation while the patient was safely anesthetized and ventilated. This was a game changer. Before curare, surgeons relied on deep anesthesia to relax muscles, which meant higher doses, longer recovery, and greater risk. Curare separated the sleep from the paralysis. It's wild to think that something once designed to kill could become one of the safest and most essential tools in modern anesthesiology. Without curare, delicate surgeries that require muscles to be completely still, like chest, brain, or laparoscopic procedures, would be basically impossible. Over time, what was once a jungle poison has become one of anesthesiology's most used tools. And last but not least, we come to the most famous and controversial of all, the humble poppy. Papaver somniferum, the opium poppy, is a species of flowering plant that's been used for thousands of years to relieve pain, calm nerves, and induce sleep. Ancient texts show that the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans all used opium tinctures to dull pain during surgical and dental procedures. The ancient Sumerians were also aware of the poppy's narcotic effects, calling it the plant of joy. The flower pods of the poppy plant ooze a milky sap that the ancient Greeks called opion after the word opos, meaning juice. The milky opion is packed with natural chemicals that can produce some interesting effects in humans and other animals, the most famous being morphine and codeine. Because these compounds attach to receptors found in the brain and spinal cord, they became known as opioid receptors. When that happens, they dampen the body's pain signals and trigger a wave of calm and euphoria. For ancient healers, this was nothing short of magic. A few drops of opium could quiet agony, ease suffering, and bring on deep sleep. Of course, the same mechanism that relieves pain also carries serious risk, slowing breathing, clouding the mind, and creating a powerful sense of dependence. When you think about it, opium was humanity's first true analgesic, the first real attempt to treat pain at its source. Modern pain management and anesthesia owe much of their conceptual foundation to this plant. Morphine, synthesized and purified from opium in the 19th century, revolutionized medicine. And from morphine, we derived countless other opioid drugs that are vital in anesthesia today. Fentanyl, hydromorphone, remifentanil, each one more refined and controlled than the last. So yes, the poppy has a very long and dark history of addiction, dependence, and misuse. But it also gave us the means to relieve suffering on a scale never before possible. Almost all of our modern pain medicines can trace their roots back to that same milky sap, nature's most potent blend of relief and danger. Now that we've wandered through our spooky little garden of poisons, let's pull the lessons together. Almost every plant and toxin we've talked about started as a poison, or at least as something with a razor-thin line between helping and harming. The early history of anesthesia was less about precision and more about experimentation, trial and error, and a fair bit of mystery. People were trying to find ways to dull pain or induce sleep, but often discovered the dangers only after tragedy struck. Modern anesthesia, by contrast, is carefully balanced around three pillars, keeping the patient unconscious, controlling pain, and relaxing the muscles. And interestingly, our witches' brews of the past touch on all three of these. Deadly nightshade, or belladonna, brought sedation and delirium. Wolfsbane and monk's hood, or aconite, interfered with nerve conduction, while tetrodotoxin, the pufferfish toxin, showed us how to block signals entirely. Curare, the poison aerotoxin, gave us the gift of muscle relaxation, and the sap from the poppy plant gave us the means to dull and even eliminate what would otherwise be excruciating, unbearable pain. From these dangerous beginnings, pharmacology taught us how to separate the magic from the mayhem. We learned how to block nerve impulses safely, 
how to stop muscles from moving without stopping the heart, which is also a muscle, and how to put someone into a reversible sleep instead of a permanent one. That's why modern anesthesia is obsessed, I think rightfully so, with precision. Exact dosing, vigilant monitoring, ventilatory support, reversal agents, and strict safety protocols. So the next time you cross the OR threshold or breathe in that anesthetic gas, spare a thought for the witches, warlocks, Amazonian archers, poppy pickers, and sushi chefs who paved the way. They mix their brews with ancient knowledge, experimentation, and magic. We mix ours with modern science, monitors, and ventilators, but in many ways, anesthesia is like modern magic. We send people to the edge of life, perform miracles of surgery, and then bring them back safely. But the wonder, that ancient fascination with the quiet mystery of unconsciousness, remains in all of us today. And that brings us to the end of our Halloween special. I hope you enjoyed this journey through time, herbal remedies, poisons, pufferfish, and operating rooms. If you have a favorite weird anesthetic story or plant or animal you'd like us to explore next, drop it in the comments. Have a safe and spooky Halloween, and I'll see you in the next one.